Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here and in person. And for those of you joining us on the Sphinx Connect app, uh, we're really looking forward to this morning's session. I'm Edward Lewis, President and CEO at Caremore Center for Music and the Arts in Katona, New York. Uh, I'd like to thank the Sphinx organization for inviting me and our esteemed panel uh, to be here this morning. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Lisa Richards Tony, who's the president and CEO of APAP, who was the original moderator uh, for um, who brought this topic forward. Um, unfortunately, she's unable to be here, so I'm honored to serve as the moderator uh, for uh, for today. So today we're going to have a discussion about the work to ensure our stages look like the communities that we serve. More specifically, in ensuring this representation, what's working, what isn't, what are the barriers, what's holding us back, and who's responsible. Uh, we'll have a candid conversation about you know, what this looks like and how we can collectively work uh, together to help frame the discussion, followed by uh, a deeper dive into the conversation. Uh, and then we'll have uh, discuss what's been shared and then have questions from the audience. Uh, for those of us joining us uh, virtually, please submit your questions uh, on the Sphinx Connect app. And for those of you in the room, uh, when we get to that, the Q&A session, please uh, step up to the mic. So while I hope you've had uh, some time to read our bios online or on the Sphinx Connect app, uh, I'd like to invite our panelists uh, to briefly introduce themselves and share a few observations uh, on the topic from, that, uh, from their perspective. And then I'll weigh in from there, and then we'll dive into the conversation. So first, I'd like to start with Terrell Johnson. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Terrell Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Chicago Philharmonic. And I also serve as the uh, co-chair of the resident companies for the Harris Theater of Music and Dance, uh, where we serve over 25 resident companies. And I also serve on the board of the, uh, of the Illinois Council of Orchestras. Um, I am so excited to, to join you all for this conversation. Uh, the Chicago Philharmonic is an organization that has existed for the last 35 years, serving the tremendous ecosystem of musicians and music in the city of Chicago. We have over 185 members, so it's, it is a large uh, footprint in the, in the city for sure. We also serve about 500 in total throughout the year, and that's from uh, a significant level of partnerships in Chicago from serving the various dance companies that visit the city, various ri visiting artists, as well as we have tremendous relationships with uh, the Ravinia Festival. We've been at Ravinia for the last 30 years. And um, so I'm really pumped to, to have this conversation to talk about how we can maybe prevent our art form and our community from, from failing forward from failing forward and the work that we do to serve our communities and the work that we do to serve our, our artists and our industry. Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Karen Cueva. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all, see so many friends and so many colleagues here. I hope that this feels like a really dynamic um, and engaging conversation. Uh, I am currently the head of operations at the Lewis Prize for Music, which is a national philanthropy. It invests in leaders that are working um, in community with creative youth development organizations and really sparking catalytic change in regards to systems change. Um, for this conversation, I'm really interested in also speaking from the board perspective. A lot of my board work is related to work that's happening on stages um, that feels representative to communities. Um, I'm on the boards of Quinteto Latino, LC Summer USA, and uh, on the executive council at the Dream Unfinished, which is an activist orchestra. There are folks from all of these wonderful organizations here, so um, definitely do connect afterwards. Thank you, Karen. Amari? Good morning, everyone. My name is Omari Rush. Uh, I live just down the road in Ann Arbor, so um, so it was an easy commute for me. Uh, and um, I am the executive director of Culture Source, a coalition of cultural organizations and creative people based here in Detroit, uh, serving the uh, entire Southeast Michigan region. Um, you know, we just want to be there for folks in the arts and culture sector in the region. We want to be a model for folks across the country. 
Um, we do what we can to bring people together for shared learning um, opportunities. We want to get folks resources, so we do a lot of partnering with folks in philanthropy or anybody that has resources to uh, give to an ecosystem to move it toward even better health. We really believe in being a hub um, and the potential for us to be a hub for the sector, so we do a lot of research, collecting, sharing, generating knowledge. And, um, you know, we also understand that the world is really complex. And so we've been investing a lot in helping people um, work and change adaptively. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm really interested in this conversation today is because so much of what we're talking about when we think about representation, when we think about what we want in terms of equity, really asks us all to live in a gray space, to really see complexity, to wrestle with really tricky questions and be okay with that tension and discomfort. And so, um, you know, I'm excited to be on this stage with these folks. Um, Karen and I have been on um, Zoom calls for the last, I think, four or five years, and this is the first time that we're meeting in person, so that's wonderful. And then Terrell and I um, realized that we are both clarinetists. We're both retired clarinetists um, from Florida State University um, with Dr. Kowalski. And so anyway, so and I'm just meeting my um, my pal to my right, Ed. And so um, so it just feels really good to be on the stage and, and with you in this room today. Great. Thank you, Amari. Uh, again, I'm Edward Lewis, president and CEO at Caramore. Uh, Caramore is located an hour north of New York City, and it is renowned for presenting some of the world's best uh, artists for over 78 years. Uh, we're best known for our, our eight-week outdoor summer season, and we've expanded that into the fall and spring seasons into the Ro uh, historic Rosenhaus Music Room. We're also known for our really lush gardens and grounds and epic picnic, and you have to come in the summer. It, 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 it's fabulous. We've also added large-scale community engagement events uh, that celebrate the communities that we're serving. And we also have three mentoring programs uh, to design to nurture professional young musicians, chamber, mu uh, chamber musicians, string quartets, and vocal artists. So as a presenter at a legacy arts organization as, and as its first leader of color in 78 years, um, I've been engaged in how we balance the reverence uh, for and the relevance of the organization. And by that I mean how do I begin to dismantle some of the barriers on the path to becoming a more inclusive and equitable organization while also ensuring that our rich history and our cultural assets, we do have a historic home that has Renaissance and an Asian, uh, Renaissance and Asian art collection. Uh, how do we um, make sure that those resonate for our longtime audience and then the audiences that we're trying to develop for today and tomorrow? Now, some of that work began several decades ago as we expanded our legacy classical programming, uh, which was basically chamber, opera, symphonic, uh, to now include jazz, uh, American roots, global music, new music, and American songbook. So over the past uh, six years, and particularly since 2020, and my arrival in 2021, uh, we've put a laser focus on diversifying our classical music programming to really expand the canon of classical music repertoire by including uh, uh, and amplifying the voices of those uh, composers and performers who through um, uh, you know, systemic forces have been historically uh, marginalized. And you may, if those of you who are familiar with Caramore may have seen a big shift in our marketing materials. Uh, we've worked to really include a, a broad range of lived experiences in all of, of the artists in all the genres that we present, including our mentoring uh, programs. Um, and we've, uh, we work really hard to co-curate culturally meaningful and relevant uh, engagement events with the communities uh, that, that we're serving. Uh, we want to ensure that our newly expanding and increasingly diverse audience, audiences feel welcome or are welcomed and can hear themselves in the music and see themselves reflected from the stage. So with the assault on DEI, the recent assault on DEI, especially with the uh, gutting of affirmative action, um, it will be challenging to keep our stakeholders and our investors uh, engaged in the work to diversify our boards, our staff, our business model, and what we program on our, our stages, and how this can ultimately positively impact uh, the bottom line. So in my remarks at our 2022 gala, I, I quoted the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda, uh, Jacinda Ardern, in her Harvard commencement address where she said, 
we are richer in our diversity and poorer in our division. And that really resonated with the well-heeled audience there at that gala. So I think boards get that, get that message. So as we've seen the demographic shift in the country and the vehement response to it, it's imperative that we remain vigilant um, um, in our response to the shift and in order to address sustainability uh, for the future, regardless of the pushback. So that's the work. So with that, let's get started. But before we dig in too deeply, I'd just like for our, the panel to briefly describe the communities in, in which they're, they're, they're serving to kind of to frame the conversation. So I'll, uh, Amari, I'll start with you. The community we serve at Culture Source is first defined by geography. So again, it's um, Detroit and the seven counties of Southeast Michigan. Uh, we serve um, primarily a set of uh, nonprofit arts and cultural organizations of all um, types of um, service providers, all kinds of disciplines and focus areas. Um, art centers, science centers, orchestras, museums, historical societies, um, startup kind of entrepreneurial groups, um, folks working in art therapies. Um, so we serve them. We also, um, of course, work with artists, the kind of source material for all the things that we do in the um, creative sector. And then other folks that are really interested in working um, in working with arts and culture folk are invested in their success. So we do a lot of work with folks in philanthropy, policymakers, and such. Great, thank you. Karen? Sure. Um, I am so fortunate that throughout all of this work, there's a multitude of communities. I'll just say that for the Lewis Price for Music, it is a national philanthropy, and so thinking about um, how we are distributing funding across uh, rural, urban, suburban communities, um, particularly those that are engaging with uh, concepts of systems change and utilizing the arts to do that. Um, although there are also uh, other aspects of, of the work that we're connecting, particularly with Quinteto Latino, um, the Latino community, um, um, in the Bay Area and through the Dream and Finished, um, a lot of the New York City um, community that's interested in connecting their concert going experience with um, additional uh, political and social action. Um, so a multitude of communities and uh, really folks that want to gather together to have artistic experiences that also springboard them um, into other facets of their humanity and life. Great, thanks Karen. Terrell? Um, at the Philharmonic we serve a large community of musicians, about 500 in total, and that's um, uh, from our, our performances and also our education programs and our Academy of Music Performance. We serve a tremendous amount of partners. So we have partners from our venue partners where we're, we're performing, as well as our partners who are uh, helping us to support our performances. Um, it's, it's definitely a... a an ecosystem that we serve. So I think there's a definite balance in terms of how we can make an impact on our community. So it's definitely top of mind um, with my team and how can we continue to serve our community that also supports us so richly. So I, I say it's also evolving. So I, if you ask me tomorrow, I might expand beyond that to, to other uh, relationships. Um, I mean, we're making connections here. So I feel like next year, if you ask me, I would also say we're serving different partners or composers that we met here. Um, we have uh, three really tremendous composers and residents that we serve, and we hope to to make an incredible impact in their careers. and And so I I say you know that question will continue to evolve, but I think it's about really how do we serve to maintain the balance of our ecosystem where the Philharmonic resides and thrives. Great, thank you. Uh, Caramore is in Westchester County, which is considered probably one of the wealthiest counties in America. And we sit in probably one of the most affluent uh, neighborhoods uh, in the county. So, and also in the county, there's a very large and growing uh, Latinx community, an African-American community. Uh, my job is to figure out how to broaden beyond that uh, community. I, I don't know if some of you were at one of the sessions yesterday, Norma Lisa Thomas, who is the orchestra director at the Denzel Washington School in Mount Vernon. All right, I see you back there. Um, yeah, they've, they've become a new uh, partner uh, with Caremore. They are considered down county. My job is to bring down county and up county uh, together. Um, so that we can really begin to, to serve fully the county. Our audience draws from around Caramore, parts of Connecticut, um, as well as New York City. 
but not from the other other parts of the county. So that's the community that that we're trying uh, to reach as well. Of course, you know, our, our other community are the artists that we present. We do have three mentoring programs. Uh, one is for a year-round uh, string quartet. The other is for uh, a week-long uh, rising stars program for chamber musicians and a week-long uh, program for, for vocal rising stars. And we want to make sure that those groups are as diverse and representative of, of the larger American populace as, as possible. So um, the conversation had a great conversation about structures, systems, and practices within our organizations and how they needed to ad adapt uh, to create change and address relevancy. So I'd like to invite our panel to you know, share what innovations in their organizations um, they've begun to implement to explore as we th uh, think about you know, uh, transforming our stages. So who would like to take that first question? I can see you all chomping at the bit. Terrell, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah, I can jump in. Okay. Um, well, I, I think it's important to center things in joy. So I, I, I find myself, like in our work, like how can we, you know, because people's time is so limited, the resources are limited, and um, we want to make an impact. We want to maybe provide an escape. Um, and so a lot of the work we do is centered in, in, in joy, and uh, I, I my wife and I love the show Ted Lasso, so it's it's yeah. um, I think like a perfect example. And and so I often with my staff um, uh, talk about like how can we create an experience that transforms like the typical uh, you know you, you show up at seven thirty, you're buttoned up, you, you you walk in, you sit down, you're quiet, and you leave. Um, how can we make people be, feel more connected? How can we build the excitement, and anticipation of a performance, and and um, and so it's very centered and joy and an escape. Um, I would say I had a conversation with our photographer who also shoots for the Green Bay Packers, and we we talk a lot about because it's like that's a great uh, dichotomy, like the, the Packers, and then you're on stage with the Philharmonic, and he's an exceptional photographer, and he mentioned that you know he's noticed uh, a change and 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 the the atmosphere at our performances. And um, one thing he mentioned to me is that when he is uh, at the Packers Stadium, and I mention this office so often, so some of my staff is here and they hear this pretty often, but bear with me. Um, he mentioned that uh, at, the, at the stadium, in the locker room, before they run down that tunnel, above the doors, so all the teammates see, is a sign that says, today is on somebody's bucket list. And it's a reminder, like this is special, what we do is special, it's special to people, and it might be the first time someone is experiencing your organization. So we have conversations like with our, with our venue partners. Make sure that um, the people who are doing the great work as ushers who are volunteering their time, but make sure they um, keep that in mind that for some folks, this is the first time they're experiencing the fill. We want them to feel welcome, and we want them to know that they can come as, as they are, and so, uh, I, so much of what we do is, is centered in joy and the experience, and I feel like it's been a tremendous like honor to to craft that for people and to not forget that through all the, I mean, for our musicians, it's it's an incredible task that they do, and but you know at times it can get so serious. But how can we remember to center things in joy and the experience, and and know that our time is limited, so it's great to to make it um, special. Great, thank you. Uh, Amari, would you like to, to Sure. That? <clears throat> I thought you were going to go to Karen. So. Yeah, I was changing things <laughs> up a little bit. Changing things up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would say at, at Culture Source, um, uh, years ago, we were really inspired by um, Sarah Lewis's work on Aperture Magazine. She was the guest editor for, um, for a volume that was about representational justice. And um, one of the focuses of the um, of the edition of um, Aperture Magazine that I'm talking about uh, was about Frederick Douglass and, you know, about him being the most photographed person in the 1800s. And um, part of that being that he understood that representation matters and he understood that it was really important for people to see this black fella just like sitting in a chair or, you know, just like looking out of the window or, you know, just being kind of regular, regular. And um, we took that as real inspiration for our own work as we are um, both trying to be a model for folks in the cultural sector here and also trying to help them think about what they can do. And so for us at Culture Source, representation actually absolutely does matter. And we think about it, um, you know, when we, someone is looking at our board list and when they're looking at our staff lists, looking at 
who we're calling leaders. So if we're, you know, um, doing a workshop talking about leadership development, well, who's leading that and, and who are we labeling a leader? Um, we think about that when we think about who our contractors are. Um, and certainly, of course, um, when we think about the artistic side, about who's on stage. And so these are little tiny things that you can do. You know, Ed, you were talking about um, your marketing materials. It's like, and, you know, certainly Terrell was talking about this um, Packers photographer. It's like who shows up in your materials? And it's not about always some kind of big initiative to kind of revolutionize these structures or or create new policies or plans. It just is like take different kinds of pictures, like make different choices. And these are like day to day actions that um, that we just have to remember to do. And and uh, at Culture Source, um, one of the things that that we do is, again, just really try to help people think that, um, you know, again, representation matters and that you can just be making choices incrementally day to day to kind of move things forward. Great. Thank you. Karen. Well, Mari, I really appreciate your point on leadership um, because at the Lewis Prize for Music, we've been um, not only distributing funding, but also generating a lot of uh, research and papers. And so some of our research has been um, published in a mid-casting report. I know everyone wants to read another report, but um, I encourage you all to check it out. And, uh, and talking about as we're speaking of not only representation, but also just in general, lifting up creative youth development within, within our society, um, thinking about the organizations that are centering youth voice and that are also engaging in systems change work, um, strongly correlated in our national survey with BIPOC leaders um, and leaders that are engaging in programs that have multiple entry points across genre musically um, and that they're also offering direct services, meaning uh, services beyond musical instruction. Those could be food pantries, those could be um, transportation, all, all sorts of additional services that um, facilitate the access to um, the high quality instruction. And so when thinking about uh, the sort of representation we also want to see on our stages, I'm also thinking about youth. Um, and youth power and youth voice. Uh, for those of you who were able to attend the Tati Mixer last night, um, it was really great to have young people uh, in, in their stages of musical learning performing and feeling like they are, um, they are a part of this conference. And of course, as a part of the Sphinx competition, we are celebrating youth that are on that musical learning journey. Um, so as we talk about representation and who is being represented in our community, I really feel like that youth power um, portion is really vital. Great, thanks, Karen. We also had a conversation about uh, DEI plus B as a p possible driver of relevancy, and how uh, does this uh, impact innovation, you know, and bringing our stakeholders along. But we also had a question about what are the expectations of representation, and what is the actual representation that we need. So, Terrell, I'll let you talk about that because you had a really uh, great response to that. Well, I. I you know, I think it's it's holistic. It's in it's everything we do, as you were just mentioning, in terms of even um, outside of the music. It's the vendors that we are working with. Uh, representation is so important because um, I, I I've been trying to to avoid using terms like classical music or like like closing things into specific genres because it already kind of starts to scoop people out. And so um, I think by by really being careful with the words we choose and we're even defining the work that we do is important to to help um, to bring people in. Um, in terms of the music that we're performing, if we're a performing arts organization, the, uh, the, the people who are writing that music that we're performing, um, being very, I think, sensitive to I'm going to use this word a lot. Uh, ecosystem. It's important to to have your your eyes and ears open and and see um, what is what is reflected well. Like if you're programming certain music and it's not, uh, I think tonal. It's not in in tune with what your community needs. Or um, if you're not making sure to to be actively searching for the next generation or being on the cutting edge. I think sometimes we look to the past, which is so important, but also look into the future. Like, how can we make sure that we are, are leaning in and, and also um, taking note from other companies and the innovation that they're doing in their industries? And so um, I think it's so important that we listen carefully to our community to make sure that as we 
look out into the audience. We see people of so many different walks of life, of, of so many different abilities, and um, that we, ha we take the opportunity to, to put it and just infuse it into everything that we do as uh, when we wake up in the morning, to when we go to bed, like how have we made an incremental change to affect um, the, the appearance of our ensemble, the way the ensemble is uh, performing, the way we're communicating. I think it's very holistic. Um, and I, I think it's so valuable to, to just not, you know, the, the, I, I think at times we can also measure things a little too, bit too much, but I think it's, it's important to just, to just make incremental changes. Mm -hmm. It's like exercising, I guess, is, <laughs> is, you know, um, sometimes people are like one more set, one more set. And you, you, you just do one more. Um, eventually, you know, you'll get to that, that summer body, but, uh, <laughs> Um, Start so, so that's what I try to, to just keep in mind um, throughout. Great. Uh, last year I talked about something in one of my panels about relentless incrementalism versus rapid radical change. And I think uh, you, you're getting at that. How do we move uh, these things forward? So uh, Karen, do you want to share a little bit about sure. what um, you've been doing? Yes, and I think that um, absolutely thinking about a holistic approach and building those relationships, I really also believe that we have to trust in artists, um, particularly artists that have a, a really convicted point of view. Um, and I'm thinking about Quinteto Latino, how, you know, from my first Sphinx to now, I've, I've observed the, the wave of conversation around DEI and also knowing that there are groups who have been out here for over 15 years dedicated to, you know, like QL performing the music of Latino composers and understanding that there is a trust, um, even when no one's looking out to particularly spotlight that at the time, that there is the artistic um, impetus to, to sustain um, and to understand that, you know, this um, cultural music is really important and that this is classical music and that this expands, um, you know, the, the humanity within classical music. And so being able to understand uh, how to place that trust in artists and understand that they, um, they have not only the vision, but the technique um, and the capacity and the musicianship to have full performances that really galvanize audiences. Great. Thank you. Amari? Well, I, you know, Ed, I really like your framework of um, relentless incrementalism. Right. Um, <laughs> and um, because part of what's baked into that is the concept that trust is built over time. Um, I know a lot of us would like things to immediately change or immediately be different, but um, but that's just not the way that, that we're wired. That's not the way that things work. And so understanding that trust um, is really only built over time means that we have to stay in the game um, and that um, things like representation, like showing up um, um, the way that, you know, showing up aligned with your values, making sure that your organization shows up every day aligned with those values in every dimension of its work uh, is the thing that starts to move the needle forward. And it's the thing that then allows us, you know, a year, five years, a generation later, to really start to make some bold moves or to really start to have people just go with us and um, and trust us. And so I would just say, um, you know, none of us should take for granted what it means to just stay in it and, um, and just remember that trust is built over time. Great, thank you. So we get to the question, so what's working and, and what isn't? And I'll give a quick example at Caramore, what I found has worked for us. So I arrived in 2021, and in 2022, we had our first ever Juneteenth uh, celebration. We did it jointly with the town of Bedford, um, and it was an award-winning uh, event in, in that community. Uh, we uh, worked very closely with uh, the local uh, Baptist church. And I remember the pastor said to me, oh, my God, Ed, I've never seen so many people of color here in Bedford. You know, what's going on? But we were very intentional about engaging that, that, that congregation and others uh, in the region. And we implemented what we called an influencer strategy uh, in our community engagement uh, uh, work so that we worked with the influencers at uh, some of the larger institutions that we were 
seeking uh, to serve not just the religious, but also the Northern uh, Westchester Boys and Girls Club, uh, Neighbors Link, which uh, works with recently um, you know, arrived um, uh, immigrants from, from Central America and, and so forth. And we developed this strategy so that when we uh, presented uh, the Chevalier in 2022, um, we were able to have a large component, a larger component of the community that we would have never uh, gotten if we hadn't implemented uh, the strategy. It was funny because it, some of the, the, the um, data from our surveys that we were doing in our strategic planning uh, process showed that audiences really wanted to learn about um, you know, cultures other than their own and or to socialize. Uh, and so we have a very inquisitive uh, audience. So we present the Chevalier, and two examples. One person said, it's great that uh, Chevalier and Mozart got together, but Mozart's Mozart. <laughs> and then another uh, gentleman who was not BIPOC said, oh my god, this is fabulous. How can I learn more about Chevalier? And then all the other artists and composers that were marginalized throughout history. So you know that, that for us is working, that, that for us the... Um, the, 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 you know, the influencer strategy is really working, building out our audience and really uh, working to have relevant programming for those specific audiences. So, uh, team, can you share an example? What, what's working? Maybe something that's, that's not so much. Um, I can jump in. Uh, yeah. I, I think we've had a lot of success through collaboration. So for us, what's working is um, uh, having very thoughtful, meaningful partnerships with with folks. Um, uh, there, there's there's quite a few examples I'd love to give. Um, uh, last year, we worked with a, a number of Japanese organizations, and we did a performance um, with uh, a terrific artist named uh, Kishibashi, and he is a multi instrumentalist, and he is a Japanese American. But he wanted to tell uh, an important story for his family, and and something that you know I when having conversations with him, and I love his music, and I I remember that was never taught to me when I was a kid. Like I never in high school did I know that uh, there was a series of uh, there's a time where we uh, entered over a hundred thousand Japanese citizens, and it was such an impactful and important story that he had written to music and um, I just wanted to be involved and um, we connected with several different Japanese organizations um, a member of my team who's here uh, did a terrific job um, coordinating a lot of efforts with different Japanese organizations about the day of remembrance and um, making huge connections with our community but we can't do it on our own. So that was uh, like an incredible meaning partnership where we're playing great music and we're telling um, an incredible story about a period of time um, in our history that still affects people to this day. We had uh, a board member whose parents were uh, affected. Um, I the stories that from people who attended that program and told me how their lives were impacted, and it was uh, just kind of a testament to how important collaboration is in terms of how we can meet together with an artist, we can meet with different cultural organizations throughout our city that are have been um, telling this story and amp help to amplify, but not, uh, we, we can't do it on our own. And um, another thing with our organization is that our, our strength has really been through these collaborations in terms of performance uh, partnerships we've had throughout the years and, and so, the theme of you know this this conference amplify, I think that takes uh, partnership, and so we can't operate in silos. And so what we're doing right is by not operating in silos and by um, partnering, we are um, ensuring that we're really making authentic and meaningful relationships, especially with voices that haven't often been heard. Um, and then what we're doing wrong, I think, is uh, at times there are organizations that have so much influence and so much power, but need to, to kind of drive. And so, if they are trying to connect with uh, uh, communities that have been that have been kind of pushed aside, they're still wanting to be in the driver's seat, and they're not wanting to give the artist the the voice. They're not wanting to to really make it an authentic uh, attempt. So, I think um, that's kind of a highlight of what we're doing wrong. But I feel like there's um, there's so much potential in terms of if we can continue to partner with folks to um, just push the needle forward in terms of you know, DEI and 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 um, just being very impactful. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen. 
Yeah, to follow up on this, I feel like partnership is is definitely crucial and reciprocal partnership. This is one of the criteria for our granting, um, for our awarding through the Lewis Prize and finding that organizations that are mutual in building towards systems change are those that are going to be most successful in engaging with that. Um, we're living in a really vital time uh, where art has a real potential to um, speak to a lot of the not only the challenges that we have, but the worlds that we want to live in. And I really believe that um, not only is partnership one avenue, but it's it's going to be the sustainable factor. Um, and also thinking about uh, considerations on how we're going to approach the systems change, um, considering amplifying genre, uh, staying a little less tied to what we are preserving. What are we preserving um, in a lot of these um, concerts where we are celebrating um, birth years and death years and all of these things. Um, I, I have found that what is working uh, across the, the landscape of, of my work is organizations that are speaking to this moment, um, that are interested in creating a, a more just and fair world and offering um, really innovative and exciting artistic avenues to bring people together to speak to that. Great, thank you. You know, when I think about what we see working, um, you know, one of the things is when we see leaders um, just slowing down to take a breath um, and to ask a better question, ask another question. In this work, uh, there are a lot of folks, leaders who feel like they always have to have an answer, like they need to be able to solve problems quickly and immediately. And that doesn't uh, make space for the kind of complexity thinking that we need to do. That doesn't make space for us to be empathic. It doesn't make space for a lot of things. And so um, when we're seeing leaders um, really work thoughtfully in new ways, um, in ways that are um, really partner focused, it's when they are slowing down, taking a breath and asking yet another question and then yet another question and trusting that what one learns from those questions actually starts to chart the path forward. That's the, the data that we need to do the work, even though, um, you know, both societally and likely within um, some of your organizations, uh, there's much more of a demand for immediate action, immediate change, um, and, um, and that just is really tough and not sustainable. Great, thank you. And actually, you're leading us to what one of our uh, the media part of, uh, of this is. Um, what does failing forward mean? You know, we, when we met and we talked about that th this topic, we thought, well, is it really failing, or are we failing up? You know, what does that? Uh, you know, is failing forward on us or the industry? You know, are we moving forward some of the same systems that have not led to change? And how do we prevent the industry uh, to push forward one type of agenda um, where what we need is that experimentation and, and trial and error? So Amari, do you want to talk a little bit uh, about that since you got us started there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I really like the, the language of failing forward. Uh, I like um, the kind of uncompleted action of the word failing and that the purpose of it or the outcome of the failing is that you are actually still moving forward. Because um, we got to be taking risks. Um, and we got to know that those risks are getting us to yet a better place. Um, the kind of uncompleted action of failing forward uh, also goes against a lot of um, the comfort craving that we have um, in our organizations and society where you know, it's just like, just tell me the plan or just tell me the action steps or why don't we just hire this one person to solve our organization's problems or why don't we just like put a black person on stage and then it'll satisfy all the people. You know, it's like these, these very simple solutions, these superficial solutions, these quick band-aids um, that are meant to be discrete moments in time um, aren't really... Um, getting us far enough, but this idea of continually being in the process of um, relentless incrementalism, taking lots of steps forward, disappointing people regularly, but knowing that 
you're always learning in that and you're always moving forward. Um, it's a really courageous, um, um, it's a really courageous phrase and a, a real call to action. Um, again, that goes against what, um, what we're comfortable with. Great, thank you. There was a conversation about how do we have the space to take that big swing to do something really big, um, uh, considering all the eyes that are on us. So does someone want to talk about that? I think, hey, Karen, you had sure. mentioned. Sure. Yeah, I think absolutely. Underscoring everything that Omari has said, and I think that it's important to note like who has the risk capital, right, to be taking these big swings, um, to understand that oftentimes leaders of color um, are placed in positions where they might fail and might not always go forward, right? <laughs> and so that there's that there needs to be some real um, board support as well, and to be able to uh, create that space of curiosity and learning and understanding that we. Um, are building towards something uh, through our work that is sustainable. Um, I'll just stop it there because I know Terrell has a lot to say on this, and and I definitely want to hear some some audience questions. Thank you. I wanted you to keep going. Uh, I liked <laughs> risk capital. I like that. I, I think we should. That's a good evaluation internally um, or and externally, maybe with um, your partners. It's like how much risk capital have you been afforded? Um, that's right. That would be something in terms of and um, creativity. Um, Wow, I'm gonna have to think about this now. I think, like, I'm moving forward. I'm gonna have to ask myself, how much risk capital have I afforded my team? How much have I afforded my visiting artists? Because in order to be, um, uh, in order to be creative, there's so much risk. There's so much. Uh, like, I think creati creativity lives in that uncomfortable zone, and um, and if we haven't afforded people the ability to to sit in that uncomfortable zone where 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 innovation really takes place, then we're not. Um, then we would fail forward, uh, certainly. So, wow, you just that's, thank you for that. I think that's so interesting. So, um, I, well, I'll pass. I'll leave it there. I think. That's All right, thank you. Yeah, and I think embedded in this work, you know, we didn't talk uh, really uh, take a deep dive into who's responsible for this work. Clearly, uh, uh, the artists, but also uh, the, the leaders, but also our boards. We have to engage our board, uh, boards uh, and have let them have some skin in the game in, in terms of you know mitigating uh, that that risk. So I think that that's something that the community uh, partners that we have, but particularly our boards. You know, I'm always looking at the balance sheet, you know, the, uh, the bottom line, and I'm always trying to, you know, validate that the more diverse we are, actually, it can positively impact uh, that, that bottom line. Uh, one thing with our, 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 our strategy that I talked about earlier is that we did see some of those same audiences come back a year later for completely different programming. So that's something that that's a long uh, term strategy uh, uh, that that we're implementing, but we are seeing some progress there. So this work takes a lot out of us. So how do we protect ourselves, you know, uh, in, in doing uh, this work? Anyone want to take a, a swing at that? I know for me personally, I, I do a lot of reading. Um, uh, one of the, the books I, I want to read that, that just came out is Michelle Norris's um, uh, Art Hidden Conversations. It's part of the Race Card Project where Americans were asked to submit in six words you know, their thoughts on race a, a, in America. And you know, the, there, there are a couple of very interesting uh, humorous ones like, we all taste like chicken. <laughs> the other was, white privilege, earned it, owned it. Own it, enjoy it, excuse me. The other is black boy, white world, perpetually exhausted. So how do, we, exactly, so how do we remain committed to this work? It is exhausting because there's so many constituents that we have to respond to and keep moving this forward. Amari? You know, it gets to that, the kind of idea that the only thing you can really control is yourself. And mm -hmm. so... I really, um, I, you know, stay in the work um, and um, and don't kind of lose it all the time <laughs> by just really making sure that at the end of the day I'm focusing on myself and that I'm very clear about my values. I'm very clear about what I'm trying to be, where I'm trying to be better, um, that I'm in relationship with folks who I know are willing to give me insights and advice about what they're seeing in me or about how I might be able to be better, and then working at that. And so, um, and 
I, within that own kind of personal journey, and I kind of said this a little bit ago, I am just completely, I've just completely accepted that I'm going to disappoint people, that I'm going to say the wrong thing. (laughs) And I'm not um, worked up about that. I'm not nervous about that. Because again, I'm saying the things that I'm saying from a really grounded place of principle, from a grounded place about belief about the change that I want to see in the world and the role that I think I could play in it. And so it makes all of the the things that go wrong um, feel a little bit smaller um, because of what I, um, what I feel and believe and how I keep it to the surface. Great. I know we're going to uh, be approaching uh, Q&A time, so we want to uh, get us into, so how do we work together collectively you know, to, to move this, this uh, work uh, forward? I believe each of us on the panel, each of you in the audience, uh, and you know, an organization like Sphinx, we do have the power to shape what is seen on our stages. Uh, we all have, have that, that power. We just need to own it. So how do we work you know, collectively you know, as an industry? Uh, any thoughts on that? Karen? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I think to, well, certainly leverage opportunities like these gatherings to be able to come together. And I, I don't know about you all, but I've been having some conversations in these dinner times, in these mixers, in these coffees in between sessions, as well as learning from these sessions to understand, oh, I should really be in touch with this person. Not only because... Um, we know that oftentimes we might be in this work, but in many different capacities and hats might change over time, but folks that are in it that have, you know, these, these qualities, Omari, that you've been talking about, you know, this really under strong understanding of self and understanding who you're working for and with, um, to be able to understand that no, no matter where this person is located within the ecosystem, that you can build bridges with them. And so I think that, um, the opportunities to cultivate relationship and to really understand what are folks' is, um, bottom line in this work, right? Are you interested in um, like diversifying your stage for the next two years, or are you really interested in seeing um, a field in the next twenty five years that um, that is really reflective of of where we are? Um, and so I, I am encouraged by the folks that have that um, long term vision planning and are also really interested in that detail um, to to keep equity at the center of every decision every day. And that's really tiring, but that is the work. And so um, I look forward to hopefully connecting with a lot of you. Great, thanks. Uh, Anyone else want to address that? Um, Yeah, I think um, think an important thing for us in this work together as colleagues is to also ask each other, you know, going back to your, your previous question about how do we kind of um, maintain ourselves and, and, you know, keep our stamina in the work is um, something I'll, I'll mention in Alpha's work and mention often in our Sphinx Lead program is, is having your own personal board of directors. Mm-hmm. And uh, I see people nodding. I see some of my, my fellow leaders in, in the audience. And uh, I think that's that's how we can we can make sure that's our our compass. So those are the people we can go to um, when we're we're so passionate about what we're doing. But maybe to 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 point out this isn't working quite well for me. But they know your vision, they know your mission, and they can help you to see it from an, another light. And and you know that like crafting that personal board of directors, I think, is so important for each of us to to sustain in this work. So, you know, just knowing I can be connected with you all and, and talk about some of the, the challenges we have. And you have such unique experience and talent and talents within your individual roles. Um, it's, is, is so important to each of us to have that, that community um, to sustain, but also to move forward um, our individual goals, work, which is collectively the same goal. Can I also just add one sure. more thing yeah. to that is um, I'm, I've been really encouraged by the conversations that youth are having here and that people are having with youth. And um, I really believe that uh, they should be um, the ones at the, the head of the ship um, because ultimately we are envisioning um, worlds that that are from our lived experiences with our own musical trainings and our attachments to things. And so um, they are just coming from a, a, a a different perspective, a different experience, and um, it's wonderful to have that here, and I encourage that everywhere. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for some questions, if you'd, someone would like to step up to the mic. 
Hello everybody, my name is Jalen. I'm your engagement liaison today and I'll be facilitating the Q&A. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to come up to the mic and share. And for those of you online, please submit your question via the Sphinx Connect app. Good morning, thank you for this. My name is Victoria Gow. I'm the Artistic Director and Conductor of the Capital City Symphony in Washington, D.C. You blew my mind with your concept of incremental change. I love it. I'm going to keep it for the rest of my life. Oh, relentless uh, incrementalism. Relentless, <laughs> relentless incremental. incremental. Uh, so my question for you is, how do we balance this concept of relentless incremental change in our conversations with funders who want to see immediate change in such a way that we are not, we do not have to move ourselves away organizationally from the continual important work that we're doing to see that long range change, um, right? So we can, we can have both of those conversations successfully. Great, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that or? Mario, would you like to go? Uh, Mario, or I can. Oh. Uh, Everybody, go for it. Go for it. We'll yeah. share. We'll share. We'll, we'll share. I, have, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to. Well, this is a fantastic question mm -hmm. um, because I think this is where, at times, when we're chasing funding, we can get we can get pulled away. But our our mission is our center. Like mm -hmm. we 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 have to maintain um, we have to maintain our mission uh, and our vision. So I think it's it's very important. We're we're all fundraisers. We're we're it's. I don't want to say sales, but we have. It's very important that we can be excellent storytellers and explain how important our individual missions are within our, you know, within our communities. So, um, in, in terms of of how do we make sure that they're aligned, is those are sometimes it's not going to work out. I mean, truthfully, I think there are times where a funder might just not be aligned with your mission, and you have to also be able to to say like we're not really in the in the right space right now. You know, this is what our organization needs, and uh, we would love for you to come back at another time and keep them involved. But I think it's also important to to call out when, um, because they might really respect that and say, "Oh, well, sorry, we had the wrong impression. We thought you, you you wanted funding for this particular project." But if you can center them back into your mission and the importance, because um, without that, if we're chasing funds, we can very quickly drift away from the mission, and. Um, and you know, ultimately, without having that compass as an, as an organization, or whether you're performing, whether you're uh, a pack, it's it's um, it's 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 a recipe for complication. And ultimately, those funds um, you'll often find when you're trying to chase the money. I've noticed that you're creating more challenges. You're creating more projects. Uh, so so that's been. Um, my my goal is in terms of like how do I stay centered in the mission? Yeah, absolutely. And um, related to mission, this is why vision is so important. And um, and not vision like the the one sentence or two sentence vision statement, but a real articulation about the future that you see, where you're the future that you see and what it looks like, and being able to be very articulate, very um, visual or um, kind of visual about it um, so that people can see, for instance, funding partners, the arc, they can see where you're headed. And then under that, you can start to talk about the radical incrementalism, those things that you have done that are getting you to that place, what you think you might do that are getting you to that place. And the right funding partners will be, um, satisfied by that the right funding partners will be inspired by that um and the wrong ones won't get it they won't see it or they won't know how you're going to get there and they won't believe in you and that just is the way that the world works in terms of finding people to invest in our work to be our allies is some people just don't have vision and they can't see the thing and i think we have to then resist um the temptation to just then do these um swift superficial band-aidy things um just to satisfy folks this is why you know companies making statements has you know it doesn't um doesn't age well because it's it's not actually helpful it doesn't mean a whole lot even though it is superficially very satisfying and so the place to make the investments are in that kind of vision that's articulated in a paragraph or a page or two pages and then in being able to talk about what are those things that you're doing day to day 
What are those things that your board is doing day to day that, you know, anybody on your team is doing day to day to kind of get you to that place or questioning what you're doing day to day in a way that gets you that place. Not to say that you can just like create a plan and then just get to that vision because it's always going to be about asking more questions, um, rethinking kind of, and just working adaptively. Great. Thank you. And I've also used, uh, R relentless incrementalism to position the organization to make rapid, radical change. You have to be strategic and, uh, and to leverage it at the right time. So there's a right time for that as you're, you're building towards something, then there will be always that opportunity to do something very quickly that is positive and, and meets the, the, the bottom line and uh, uh, serves a, a long-term strategy. Great question. Next question. All right. Um, someone says, I noticed, I've noticed organizations talking about diversity and inclusion, um, specifically dropping equity since the ruling of, from the Supreme Court. What are your thoughts? Uh, can you repeat the, the last part of that question? Uh, I've noticed organizations talking about diversity and inclusion, specifically dropping equity. It has like quotation marks or like parentheses, dropping equity since the, the ruling from the Supreme Court. What are your thoughts? Yeah, we did have a conversation about this yesterday. Uh, anyone want to uh, get get that started? Yeah. Okay. I would just yeah. say yeah. <laughs> yeah. that um, diversity and inclusion without equity is actually not mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah. And and from a um, from a funder perspective, uh, that's palpable. Right, to be community responsive in its most authentic form is to be equitable, and uh, and it it is really noticeable when um, when one is trying to just have a cosmetic procedure on on the front of an organization. Yeah, uh, I would say um, two things. One is that. I don't know. I don't get too worked up about the those words again because some of it's a little superficial to me. Um, you know, I know people that are like they say DEI or they say, well, we say DEIA or we say idea or we don't say diversity or you know, it just is like, or we don't say DEI at all because we don't want to be so trendy. We want to be feel to sound like we're being original. And so, what's what's another way to say DEI that? We don't say DEI. So it just is like, um, I think you can get wrapped up in that language and that's, you know, fine because you maybe have to, you know, put it on brochures or in reports or whatever. But I think the real investment of deep thinking is in the actual work that you're doing and, and whether or not you kind of call the thing equity superficially. Like, can people look at your work and see you acting, see you working, see you trying to be equitable? I think I'm more interested in that bit. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we're in, you know, the state of Michigan, the University of Michigan over 20 years ago, uh, you know, had its own case with the Supreme Court around affirmative action and, and lost that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and it just really changed the university's approach uh, to um, still achieving their goals for a campus that um, is inclusive, that's um, that really values um, diversity of identity, um, and, um, and is, you know, made lots of progress. And so I also think that the ruling, um, is just an invitation for all of us to get more creative, think deeper and, um, and still, um, stay the course. Great. Thank you. We have about two minutes. So we'll time for one more quick question. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Ashikawa. I'm from the Chicago Philharmonic. Um, and I have a question about unions. Um, so I grew up, I'm a violinist. I've always been really pro-union. Uh, but I'm wondering, with all the talk recently supporting union and unionization, what is the experience that you have had that either is supportive of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, with unions, and what are the cons that you've had with musicians' unions? Uh, something came up at our dinner conversation last night, and I've been thinking a lot about young musicians who just get started out, and 
they can't really get ahead because of union rules that support more established musicians. And, and this happened in LA while I was growing up. But you know, I still want to advocate for um, fair wages. And so I'm very conflicted about the whole thing. And I, I'm just curious what your experiences have been. Torrell, you want to take that one? Well, great, and, and Lori's one of my board directors, so. <laughs> um, thanks for the question, Lori. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, let's see. I, I think our, our leadership in, in, in general has a large responsibility, and, um, and there certainly are barriers for younger musicians. Like, as you know, um, you know Lori is, is a musician in Chicago. Chicago had two unions. We had a white union, we had a black union for a very long time. And like, how does that shape the city and the arts in the city, um, uh, having two separate unions and, and being exclusive in that way. And you know, obviously that that's, has changed uh, and that now this, these are joined. But in terms, of, um, in terms of, of the DEI work, I feel like our leadership um, within the arts organizations, also the great leadership from our unions have a responsibility to make sure that the, the rules that are, are in place create space and opportunity for diversity and create space and opportunity for young folk because they are often left behind. I mean, uh, in terms of recruitment, like how are they engaging um, the BIPOC citizens in town and those artists, um, whether they're currently residing there or are coming to the city. Um, so I, I would say it's a tremendous responsibility in terms of our, our leadership um, and the unions and, and also the organizations like mine, who we're a union orchestra, that follow those rules to uh, have constant dialogue and how we can be uh, effective in not leaving out um, a large uh, amount of, of individuals who might not look like the, the leadership of the union or um, might not look like, because often, you know, um, the representation um, during the period of time when they were separate uh, was likely mostly classical musicians on one side and mostly more um, other genres, jazz on the other. And so how are we making sure we're also including voices from various disciplines within the membership? So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a large duty and something that um, the great part about, you know, I'm a member of the union too, is, is the membership has a voice. And so like how we're, in addition to the leadership, how are the members uh, actively making sure that uh, efforts are made to connect with um, diverse individuals. Great, thanks, Toriel. Can, can I just say one thing one. very quickly, um, folks? I, um, we're hiring at Culture Source two brand new positions and one kind of replaced position. Somebody left and got an amazing job. Um, if you want to work with us, with me and our super fantastic team, CultureSource.org. I could <laughs> not you do do this anyway. Um, just please apply. It, oh, good idea. Organization. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our stellar panel, Terrell Johnson, Karen Cueva, Amari Rush, and you, the audience, for being engaged uh, in our conversation today. Uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>